Ashraf Shannon joins us from Gaza. And we also have Tim Anderson, director of the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies, joining us from Sydney for an analysis. Ashraf Shannon, first over to you. How are things looking there in Gaza? Well, uh, the truce seems to be holding from uh, both both sides, and uh, right now, uh, uh, all they want, uh, the people in Gaza, is uh, finding the missing loved ones, finding those who have not been accounted for. Uh, especially that I've been I keep, uh, that I've been saying this for a while now that the numbers are not the, the real numbers of uh, of the the, vict the victims. I'm talking about those who. The fatalities here, and uh, uh, I believe that the numbers will rise rapidly as soon as uh, 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 debris removal uh, equipment uh, uh, manage to get into the Gaza Strip. Because right now uh, the municipality in Gaza is basically depending on the uh, on the, uh, the the work of volunteers and also the work of uh, exhausted rescue crews. Can you imagine for uh, almost two weeks, 12 days or uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the onslaught, actually 13 now, uh, uh, rescue workers haven't had any kind of sleep. Uh, uh, they've been working uh, day and night looking for the victims, searching for, for the victims. Mm -hmm. Gaza, uh, because of the Israeli blockade and also uh, the restrictions by Egypt, because it's, it's not only the Israeli blockade. Gaza is is locked in by Israel and for most of the time by Egypt as well. Uh, the equipment uh, for the civil defense is, is falling apart. Uh, and they've been uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, to repair them with whatever uh, 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 pieces or uh, spare parts from other ve vehicles. They're trying to, to, to do all they can to have this equipment running, but it's not really working because you need uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, bulldozers and special equipment, uh, sensors and all, all sorts of, uh, of equipment that are needed uh, to search for survivors, and we don't have it here. So if someone is, 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 is under the rubble, you cannot you cannot uh, uh, you, ca you cannot reach them. All you have to do is start screaming. We s I saw this with my with my own eyes when uh, near one of the buildings where uh, around 60 people uh, were killed a f uh, uh, few days ago, as uh, the the workers uh, and the family members, even those who were injured. They were screaming and crying, you know, would they find any hole in the rubble, s screaming. To, maybe those under the, 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 the rubble can hear them or make any, uh, any sign. But, but you can't imagine the hundreds of tons of, of concrete uh, and, uh, and rebar. Uh, and these people are buried under. And the chances uh, are next to impossible, I believe, to find survivors. Okay, thank you for that. We do appreciate it. That's Afshar Shannon there talking to us, uh, uh, telling us some of the gruesome, obviously, um, events uh, that unfolded there. Tim Anderson, uh, we, know, we know that the humanitarian aspect of this in terms of the number of dead, uh, disproportionate uh, targeting by Israel in terms of uh, how we see that in the death of children and uh, women. But moving on to um, the whole scenario itself. At this point, uh, I'd, I'd like to find out from you whether you believe, as many have deducted here, that it was the Palestinian resistance factions out of Gaza that, have act that can actually claim victory over the war that was uh, imposed on them uh, over the Israeli bombing. Do you see it that way, or are you on the other camp? Yes, well, as you say, there's nothing much of victory in the humanitarian situation with the death toll rising, as the previous speaker pointed out. Um, a 20 to 1 ratio of of killings there but nevertheless in a military sense it is true that Netanyahu achieved none of his objectives and he's now subject to heavy criticism at home in that respect um, the resistance um, which includes a number of groups but particularly Hamas have said that they have also imposed conditions in relation to the ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem and also the uh, integrity of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, that remains to be seen, but in, in that sense, 
the Palestinian resistance is claiming a victory there. And it's important because it crosses, of course, between uh, the events that were going on in, in East Jerusalem before the attack on Gaza and the attack on Gaza. So when we uh, now, uh, given the fact that if we see the ceasefire hold, uh, which by the looks of it is, is going to stay that way, uh, are we looking at anything being achieved on um, the core issues? For example, what's happening uh, or what happened at Al-Aqsa, whether there's going to be any resolve there or whether there's going to be a movement towards uh, trying to resolve this uh, conflict in terms of uh, the occupier and the ones who are being occupied, and in particular, of course, the U.S. role here. Do you see any movements in that regard? Yes, I think there was some movement in that regard. I think it's probably the international pressure um, which had some impact on the U.S. administration, which is undoubtedly behind the Egyptian role in this. I mean, the Egyptian role in itself would not be that important, but I think there were messages coming from Washington that they were embarrassed by this, that their client, their, their effective proxy in the region, their chief proxy in the region was being so shamed in international terms. I don't think there's been as much shaming uh, of uh, Israel um, and, uh, as there was in this last two weeks there. So I think that pressure passed on through uh, through the brokerage of Egypt to force Netanyahu to uh, stop before he had achieved any of his military objectives. And they would have been to intimidate the whole population and to ensure that there was no um, capacity in the resistance left, something similar to what uh, Alma did in 2006 in Lebanon and failed in that respect too, despite inflicting a lot of damage on South Lebanon. So I think a similar, we, we see a similar such situation here in the sense that the Palestinian resistance is able to declare a type of victory in the sense that they have deterred the aggression and although they haven't prevailed over it. Now, the, in the longer term, the Palestinian resistance and the international illegitimacy are the key factors in terms of the longer term solution. And finally, quickly, uh, the U.S. president is pressing on this two-state solution. Many are saying that that's dead. Uh, where, where do you think things stand regarding that issue when, when you take a look at, it, look at it through the lens of the Palestinians or the Israelis or the, or the general wider world? Yes, that's a very important point because um, in the last days of the Trump administration, President Trump cranked up a plan to talk about this Bantustan type uh, Arab state that might still exist in the West Bank after all of the colonization and settlements that have gone on there. Because at least the, the liberal side of the Zionists fear that if this myth of two states goes away, they'll be faced very squarely with an anti-apartheid struggle, which they can't win. And we know that in the last four years, there's been three or four reports confirming the apartheid status of, of Israel. Now, this, in a sense, is masked by the myth the 73-year myth of two states. So I think that's a very important factor, and it's, a, it's an important factor in terms of Israel's sinking legitimacy in the world too.